And now move on to our uh, second uh, panel, uh, the panel uh, which will focus on private uh, equity uh, and looking into how um, GPs and uh, LPs uh, manage this transition and uh, how uh, how things are are done in that uh, in that uh, in that sense. So we have uh, today uh, a panel that is uh, moderated by Dr. Uh, Mark Nassim, a partner and MD at uh, Awad Capital. So I will leave the floor uh, to him. Uh, Mark, if you can take over from here. Yes, thank you, Khaled, and uh, thank you, Maali and the stream for, uh, I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, join before, but I think it was a very interesting discussion, and definitely there is an overlap between what you are talking about and some of the topics that we will cover. And uh, so, yeah, very excited to be here, and uh, I think it's a very interesting topic uh, when we talk about private equity and VC and the ESG element there. Uh, so, with us, we have uh, Bijou, who is a partner at Leap, Leapfrog Investments, and we have Karim Hagar, who is a strategy consultant and uh, an entrepreneur. Um, I will leave it to Bijou to introduce uh, himself and to Karim, and then we'll take it from there. Thanks, Mark. Um, pleasure joining this, this panel um, and indeed the discussion. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my name is Biju Mohandas. I um, am the global co-lead for healthcare at uh, Leapfrog, an impact-focused fund. We manage about $2 billion. And prior to that, I spent, um, I've spent about 15 odd years in impact investing, bulk of it with the International Finance Corporation, leading the health and education team in Sub-Saharan Africa, and was also the global lead for medical devices for them. Prior to that, another um, five odd years in, in healthcare as a, as in, in, as a clinician and, and operator. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Biju. Uh, Karim? Thanks, Mark. Very happy to be here. So I'm a strategy and sustainability advisor. I've been, I worked about uh, seven years with uh, strategy and or booze at uh, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And uh, I'm also an angel investor, um, impact investor. So I really focus on uh, climate tech, clean tech uh, startups in the region here. And uh, prior to my consulting gig, I actually founded and sold a sustainable travel business so I was uh, living and breathing sustainability and ESG. It was part of the core of my business for about 10 years. Excellent. So we, we, we have really good, uh, uh, I mean, coverage of, uh, of the topic. But I think to, 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 to start with, uh, just with the basics, uh, uh, so Bijou and, and Karim, if uh, probably I'll, I'll start with Bijou. If you can share with us, uh, we hear about ESG, we hear about impact. Um, in your view, is there any difference between the two? And where do they overlap and where do they differ? That's a, that's a great question, Mark. Fr from my perspective, they're certainly related. However, um, there is also a difference. Right? In, in the case of LeapFrog, speaking for ourselves, we call ourselves an impact investor. And what that means is we want to invest like any private equity fund would, um, aiming for top quartile financial returns. However, at the same time, we want to have very properly defined, measured, communicated development impact as well. So it is profit with purpose, as we call it. In achieving those ambitions, we will make sure that environmental, social governance, best practices are followed. Let's say we were impacting for just financial return and um, not development impact was not uh, a, a consideration. We could still follow best practices on ESG. We could make sure that our portfolio companies are doing the best they can when it comes to environment ourselves. Um, we could make sure that we track and measure social metrics, which are relevant. We could uh, ensure good governance practices, right? So, but that doesn't make us an impact investor. 
um, that makes us a f- good good quality financial investor who is um, measuring ESG properly and ensuring best uh, best achievements uh, in that. And that's not bad at all. I'm just differentiating between the two um, in in response to your question. So yes, they are different. Obviously, very very related. Excellent, Karim. Any views on that? I totally concur with uh, what Pijo said, and I think uh, from my view at least. ESG is probably uh, used more uh, broadly uh, today um, than impact investing or impact, uh, um, you know, entrepreneurship. I think that um, at least for me, impact is the the, the highest level um, capability in ESG, right? So, so if you look at ESG as a capability, for, for instance, from from the pure compliance-driven uh, businesses that just ticking boxes for the minimum requirement, uh, just to say they have a report versus those that really internalize ESG. I would say that at least for me, impact is more on the, uh, you know, the higher level um, aspect of ESG. Excellent. So l- let me ask, I mean, kind of probably controversial question here. Uh, uh, do you think that impact and ESG investing is, is, is becoming like a buzzword, just to say, and I think it was covered uh, uh, in the previous uh, panel about the greenwashing. Uh, and everyone is, is trying to do, uh, or trying to do something that probably would be seen in, in, in a good way by investors or by other stakeholders. Um, so h- how real is it? Should I, I start? Mean, if you want to start, yes. yes. So definitely, uh, Mark, uh, it's there's a, I would say almost a, an epidemic when it comes to greenwashing. Um, it's really, really uh, reached a level that is beyond, uh, I think, in my opinion, imagination. And uh, uh, we're talking private equity here, but in the public equities, there's uh, also really a, a big uh, buzz and a lot of green greenwashing. And you have to be really careful and skeptic when it comes to ratings, for instance, right, of ESG, because um, uh, most, most, a lot of investors, unfortunately, take these ratings at face value. And I totally believe that there isn't enough uh, scrut- scrutiny, but there are really good, you know, journalists that are currently trying to, you know, uh, bring, criticize and, and, and get these ratings to, to improve. Yes. So in my view, a, a lot of greenwashing, it's really hard to uh, to di- distinguish between the good and the bad and the ugly, if you're just looking at ratings at face uh, at the higher level, yeah. Mm. So, Bishu, you are in the middle of it. I would uh, yeah. really, I'm very keen to, to hear your views on that as well. No, I, I, I agreed with with Kareem. There is a fair bit of um, uh, impact washing, green washing, etc. As, as the previous panel was pointing out as well. I think there are, um, uh, being an optimist, I almost look at it in, in a, in a, uh, with a positive light in that what is happening is globally, whether you're talking about it from the retail investor's perspective and Kareem touched upon the public markets. So millennials, um, the younger investors who want to invest capital do in, the, in the public markets because that's where um, they have access they don't just want financial return. They want to make sure that the, their money is not going into harming the environment even further, uh, isn't um, uh, catalyzing some sort of um, terrible practice in uh, some sweatshop uh, somewhere and, and resulting in great margins and therefore financial return. So they want to make sure that um, good ESG practices are followed. And a lot of them actually want to go a step further. They want to make sure that there is positive impact uh, from their investment. So as a result, there's a huge demand and on and anyone sitting on the supply side is thinking, hey, how do I get a piece of that demand? Mm. And trying to um, come up with ways in which uh, some, I, I hope it is not cynical. They're trying to see how can we fit in. Maybe, maybe there is some cynical element as well, but I, let, let, let me ignore that and just focus on even the good guys trying to see how can we fit in. Um, and that will result, as Kareem pointed out, in questioning whether it's the investor, the LPs or the retail investors, investors, or uh, the larger markets, the media, the, et cetera, will question it. And as a result, we will be forced to, to be more clear about what is it that we mean when we call ourselves an impact investor. 
So for, for LeapFrog, it is uh, when we go to our LPs, we are providing them not just with our uh, IRRs from a financial perspective as a target for the fund, we are telling them this is the number of consumers we will reach, emerging consumers, and this is how we define them. Um, these are the outputs that you can expect on the financial services side. These are the outputs you can expect on the um, on the health side. And this is those number. We we are putting ourselves out there and um, willing to be measured against our performance with respect to those numbers. So so I think we claim, and, and we are not satisfied either, to be honest. We, we believe mm. we could do even more and we should do even more. So net-net, what I'm trying to say is um, the demand side, is it's great that there is a huge demand now for impact as well as ESG. Um, on the supply side, we have a plethora of um, options. It's like a big tent in which you, on the one hand, you have a more very traditional not-for-profit leaning entities who may not be able to provide financial returns. On the other end, you have um, legendary investors who have uh, over several decades provided great alpha on the financial front, and all of them are trying to crowd into this, this impact space. So how do we make sure that, that it, things are measured better? And it's, it's something for the industry to do. And having started out in this space in 2006, I do believe when you look when I look back that things have become drastically better. There are multiple standards, whether it is the IFC um, protocols that they released, um, I think two three years ago, um, and others who are coming up with uh, well, with frameworks yeah, that we can use. Uh, I think there are more than kind of ten different uh, organizations, international, locals, and, and, and uh, regional, trying to set uh, uh, kind of metrics that say and that's actually it's a good uh, segue yeah. to, to, to my next question which is okay ESG is good impact is good but how, how do we measure it how do we measure the impact that a portfolio company is is having uh, from that angle look I'm happy to go Kareem if that's okay uh, from yeah. my end uh, and 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 leapfrogs and it starts it, it, it is uh, impact Achievement of impact as well as measurement of impact is integral to our entire deal cycle. So right from um, figuring out what is our investment thesis for a particular fund, originating transactions, um, collecting data relevant to each of the transactions that we're invested in on the back of that data, coming up with value creation initiatives, and then finally exiting. So that's the traditional um, investment cycle. And across each one of those faces uh, the the impact element both the measurement of it as well as the support in terms of creating it is is integral with regards to origination for instance we are a very a specialized firm in that while we invest across um, uh, south asia and, Sub and and africa our focus is financial services and healthcare which means we have a fair bit of, so in my own case, a fair, fair bit of sector expertise and give, giving myself as an example, close 25 years just in health um, across these markets, right? So that allows, and, and all of us have um, uh, literally and professionally grown up in these markets. We live and work here. So a combination of those two things allows us to understand what are the constraints that consumers face in, in accessing these services, what are the innovations that are emerging, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, combined with our impact thesis as well, this makes us quite distinctive from other investors in the space and allows us to attract those investors, those um, portfolio companies that we believe will have the highest impact based on our sector expertise and vice versa. They want to um, want us to be an investor in their company because they see that um, we care for the impact, but we understand their sector. So that's the first bit. Origination impact is very clear. Um, it is driven by a certain thesis that is driven by a certain understanding with regards to the impact. The second bit is around um, collecting the right kind of data. So everyone collects the straightforward financial metrics, and we do that as well. We collect um, detailed operational metrics. But one thing we do that I don't think many others, if any, does, is we actually go and talk to our consumers. 
um, the consumers of our portfolio companies before we make an investment and during our investment period mm -hmm. where we try to ask them, okay, this is a product, this is a service that you're being provided. What are your thoughts around it, um, et cetera. So that, that data also comes in. And a combination of these three data points allows us to then create value creation um, initiatives, uh, draft value creation initiatives, which are tailored to, um, to, to improving the value that these companies, our portfolio companies bring to our consumers. To give you an example, um, one of our portfolio companies in East Africa is the largest chain of um, retail pharmacies right now. Um, we worked with them to go to their consumers and understand what the consumers wanted in terms of a loyalty program. And we designed a loyalty program uh, through that, that um, consumer survey. Within a year, the number, the members of that loyalty program grew 7x mark and mm. reached a number of around 100,000. And those 100,000 members uh, on, the, on the profit side, they now account for 50% of the top line of this company. And um, their typical basket size is three times the basket size of, a typical, uh, of, a, of an average walk-in customer. So on a profit side, it worked really well. On the purpose side, because now we are sticky, we, we have mutual stickiness with these customers and we know what they want. We have been providing them with not just good quality, affordable medicines, but also other things that they wanted, like primary healthcare consultations, diagnostic services, and so on. So on the impact front, um, in addition to what we had started out saying we would provide them, we are also providing additional impact. So the impact has actually grown. And obviously, we can measure it very clearly because we are hearing directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And then all of this leads to an exit path where because of the impact and because of the profitability, which is driven through the process, you are able to exit to a um, a good quality investor, either strategic or financial, who will take each of these things to the next level. And we have multiple examples of that. Don't want to um, monopolize the time. So I, I would leave it at that saying the entire cycle, we look at how to define, measure, and then also catalyze impact, not just measure, but catalyze impact. And this is how we do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bijou. That's very, very helpful. And, uh... Uh, so Karim, anything to add on that point? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Biju. Maybe there's, uh, from an investor perspective, you know, as Biju was saying, you 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 source the right uh, investment, or in my case, as a micro investor, uh, an impact uh, startup or or clean tech startup. And and the other the other aspect is for for the portfolio companies that you currently have, you you, you implement basically capabilities around ESG. To, to really help them, you know, become more, uh, you know, capable from an ESG perspective. And this, as Bijou was saying, helps a lot when it comes to your exit. And I think this is, a, you know, we're seeing impact uh, startups now with, with uh, multipliers or with premiums when it comes to their valuations, right? Um, and there's a lot, there's really crazy demand right now for responsible impact startups that also have obviously a viable business model and, and a strong technology. And so if as an investor, you don't have this competitive edge to really support them when it comes to ESG to, uh, and support all your startups or, or all, all your investments across the, the portfolio, uh, it becomes really harder to and one, be selected as an investor and to uh, exit eventually or, or find uh, you know, uh, an acquisition or uh, you know, launch an IPO for instance, right? Thanks, Karim. Actually, yeah, Bijou, you mentioned uh, something, I mean, very interesting, and I wanted to, to, to touch upon it, which when you said that you look at it across the cycle. Uh, but based on was, when I was preparing for, uh, for the panel, I was reading a report by, uh, by INSEAD, the Global Private Equity Initiative of INSEAD, and they found out, actually, based on... Uh, on uh, their kind of poll and, and discussions with a number of some of the largest uh, private equity funds in the world that the focus on ESG is mainly towards the exit and towards the investing life cycle. Because obviously when you are exiting, you want again to use the kind of green wash and say, I'm doing something good here. And when you are investing early on in the early kind of life cycle of, of, of the investment say yeah, I raised the money and now I want to invest in 
ESG, uh, you know, and, and impact uh, uh, companies. But then whenever it goes to the 100-day plan, to the portfolio management and to towards the end of the portfolio management, towards the uh, beginning of the exit process, you don't see a lot of ESG initiatives or a lot of a focus on, on, on that element. So I'm, I'm not sure if you concur with that as well from your point of view. For, for my, hmm, I think it's a great, maybe it does happen from our perspective because the profit and purpose impact and returns, financial returns are so joined the hip that we have... We don't decouple. We can't. And I can give you numerous examples. For what, right from the strategy, for example, in healthcare investing, we try our best to um, leverage uh, our investments or, or invest in those companies who use one of two means or a combination of both to, in a very capital efficient fashion, reach as many consumers as possible. So that means on the uh, more traditional um, healthcare front, we are investing in asset light business models, right? So um, uh, again, using Good Life as an example, um, these are, these are, they reach their consumers by setting up very, very low cost, low capex, high ROC units, which allows them to set up a lot of them and because the ROC is quite high, the return on capital employed is quite high, they break even relatively fast. And when they break even fast, they can set up even more of those. So as a result, that positive cycle kicks in where you have a lot of these units very close to the consumer. They can res res respond very quickly to the consumer and so on. So f f the reason I brought that up is our investment thesis is tied. Um, to getting these as close to the consumer and therefore providing as much impact as possible. So all right from that beginning process where we are articulating the strategy uh, and, and to, to find why did we articulate the strategy this way? Because we heard from our consumers that this is where they are getting bulk of their healthcare in, in, in Africa, in emerging markets, in, in India, um, um, uh, many other South Asian countries as well. A lot of the times, the first point of call for uh, uh, for the kind of consumers we reach, um, we call the emerging consumers people and households earning between two to ten dollars per day. Their first point of call is the is the small healthcare unit, usually a pharmacy. So if you are able to build out a unit economics, a robust unit economics around that, you will get closer to them. You will have a lot of them, and therefore you will be profitable, which is what happened in the case of Good Life. Again, um, value-adding add initiatives, we reduced the um, cost of setting up a, a unit by almost half. Um, uh, so as a result, we could set up two times the number of units than we could with the same amount of capital. We reduce, we help reduce the break-even time of those units from around a year to about four months, which means they break even faster. So there's more cash in the system, so you can set up more. Um, we helped improve the gross margins without increasing the price, which meant we were able to have some flexibility around pricing to um, increase re or reduce prices where necessary to get to the kind of consumers we want to get to. So, so, oh, so from I hear what you're saying, but from my perspective, if you start with uh, a coupling of the impact as well as profit goals, it allows you to narrow the kind of things you can do, which means you'll be laser sharp, your focus will be very sharp, and you'll be trying to do them really well which results in uh, benefits on, on both sides. So from, from our perspective, it is a virtuous cycle. We don't see the decoupling or, or divorce of those two. And because it's a virtuous cycle, we have to do it throughout. We can't just um, plug in at the beginning or at the end. It has to be there throughout the deal cycle. And probably, Vishal, because you, you are a very focused investor on ESG, well, probably the, the, the generalist PE funds, they want to be seen as doing good uh, but they are not specialists. They are not only focusing on, on that. They are still probably yeah. investing in some oil uh, producing companies in the US or uh, some other businesses that don't respond to ESG uh, principles. Um, I would like to ask Karim about, uh, and we, we, we've heard it also probably, uh, and Han mentioned it towards the end of the first panel about uh, the sovereign wealth funds getting more involved as, as LPs. But beyond the sovereign wealth fund, so if we go one step uh, kind of up, what is the role of the government, you think, Karim, in implementing and probably in 
encouraging uh, ESG investments when it comes to uh, so uh, I think there are several ways the government can be involved, right? So number one is regulation, right? There is, I think, um, Ali was mentioning pre on the previous uh, discussion that there is a lack of clarity when it comes to regulation, but there is a movement and there, are, there is change happening. Um, and uh, that's that's uh, number one. Uh, number two is uh, education, right? So creating awareness around uh, ESG and around sustainability. Um, this is really important and it's uh, lacking, uh, I, I think, in the region. There is a movement with a younger generation for sure, but in education programs to educate across uh, funds, for instance, that, that there could be a support from the government. The third one is procurement. Government procurement is, is, is immense. And I think that uh, if the governments are very serious when it comes to uh, ESG-related procurement or, and, and, and they have clear roles, uh, clear rules when it comes to the selection process based on your ESG uh, performance and your track record when it comes to sustainability. This is a proven way for government involvement and it's, it's, uh, it's used in Europe and in, in North America across the globe, right? Maybe one thing from a regulatory perspective as an example, right? So uh, in Egypt right now, as we speak, um, they, there's a new um, regulation by the financial uh, regulatory authority that every, any company on the Egyptian stock market has to have an ESG um, report, right? So that didn't exist and it just started now, like a few weeks ago. So this is really great news for, for a country like Egypt and the region. And it pushes everyone to actually understand and get educated. And it creates a, a whole series of startups and businesses that consult that you know help these larger corporations become more sustainable. Yeah. I assume there is now a big business for kind of or big place for ESG consultants, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm Absolutely. not sure actually. I mean, how active they are or how many there are, but uh, that's another avenue for. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, you, you, while preparing also for this, and we discussed it uh, early on, is what we can call you know the uh, impact alpha. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, as a private equity investor, you come, you buy a company which has nothing to do with ESG, but then you implement the ESG principles and you focus on the on, on ESG, and then you can sell for a much higher premium than what you would have done without the ESG. So, Bizu, any any views on that from uh, PE practitioner? No, 100% aligned. Um, I, and I think it's, as I said, it goes beyond ESG. For us, it is... Um, our, our mission is to do that with impact and um, in, in all, the fact that we have been able to raise three funds successfully now and deploy and, and um, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a testament to the fact that when you do both, when you uh, focus on the top quintile uh, financial performance as well as um, achieving significant impact, you do get um, uh, get a, get that distinctiveness and and you do stand out. Um, uh, just from a numbers perspective, for example, this this particular fund, when we went to our LPs, we said on the healthcare front only, um, we will reach about ten million customers, and we are only in fund uh, in year four. We have already reached sixteen million. Um, customers, right? And that um, is also reflecting in our, um, in the FMV of our portfolio, um, which is um, certainly top quintile at this point um, per the latest audit. Um, and we will be announcing our first uh, uh, exit as well soon um, within the four years. So, so I think um, we completely believe in that that uh, thesis that you just articulated or hypothesis, which which is if you do provide good quality ESG um, to your company, your help your companies achieve great quality ESG, um, then you will get um, good returns at exit. I, I would go a few steps further. In our case, we would say ESG is a given. You have to have that but also development impact um, to, to be able to write at the beginning, say, this is the kind of development impact we will provide, uh, define it well, use um, innovative means to measure outputs as well as outcome, communicate that um, along with your financial returns. So if you do both, partly because there is such a huge demand for 
and few very limited supply of fund managers who do both well you will gain and secondly um, when you when you're looking at south asia and sub and africa in general the largest consumer group fall within that what we are defining as emerging consumers these are the um, families which dominate the marketplace they are underserved right now in the in the markets that we are talking about or, or the sectors we are talking about financial services and healthcare so if you are able to work with great quality entrepreneurs to deliver them those services obviously you will have um, a huge financial impact because they are the largest market um, the high income and and middle income are still smaller compared to the lower middle income and and aspiring um, middle income so uh, yeah we are you're preaching to the converted um, mark when it comes to that so do, do you think i mean and that's also a question to both of you do you think that kind of the esg uh, mandate would become the norm in the future where we will not see any non esg uh, portfolio companies for example yes for sure just to to respond absolutely there is uh, we're on the way to making ESG a mainstream requirement across the board. Um, but maybe, Mark, to add to what uh, Bijou was saying um, for regarding the uh, impact alpha, achieving impact alpha, I think, again, it's, it's all about linking ESG to your strategy and to value creation, right? Making ESG core in your business. And I think that's where uh, there's a huge uh, difference between uh, different investors. And there aren't necessarily... Um, dedicated funds for impact investing here in, in, in the region. There are some up and coming funds that take impact more seriously for sure, but there's a need. Um, and I think that in their thesis, um, this is what is really required is to make ESG as part of the core strategy of their portfolio companies, right? And um, uh, investors can support um, businesses in, in that direction, right? So. You know, ESG should become something that is discussed in the board meetings, but it's also be something that is um, felt and understood and lived by the entire organization, right? So that, that's an issue that we see across the board is that it, ESG is discussed in a very small circle. It's in a nice report, but uh, it's not being lived by the organization. I think what we see more often are startups that actually live by uh, ESG or are impact oriented, and we see it a bit less in the larger corporations, but there's definitely a positive trend. Excellent. Thanks, Karim. Uh, so, Khaled, probably uh, it would be a good time now to, uh, because we, we have a, a poll to, uh, to everyone. Uh, can we put it, uh, Khaled, now? I'm curious to know what would the, the result be. That's quite interesting that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, any views on that, uh, Bijou? No, I, I completely agree. And I, I don't think um, one should sacrifice, one needs to sacrifice returns uh, for ESG. I, I, if there is, particularly for ESG, it's, um, there's no reason um, why one should do that. There, there's a, there are numerous um, pathways to, in fact, do, uh, great call as we have discussed through this panel right so i i don't i don't want to repeat it but um if you have great quality as your returns will go up um in in this um in in the global context that we are living in so absolutely they don't lps don't need to and if there is there are gps who claim that it is required then they'll probably lps will take their money somewhere else um so in that 
I am uh, in, in that context, I'm 100% aligned. I would even go a step further um, and also claim that even the larger impact need not be divorced from uh, financial returns. Of course, there are certain sectors, certain segments of the population where uh, private capital cannot reach directly at least. And, and that is the role for the government, for not-for-profit, um, really to help provide that um, trapeze net um, to, to support those, those um, really indigent individuals. But um, the larger market segment of the consumers uh, to achieve great quality impact in their lives by backing um, financially sustainable, viable companies, even that is a possibility. So I'm a, again, complete believer in, in what the um, audience seems to have pointed out. No, I think, yeah, doing well while doing good is not something, uh, it should be something normal, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, great, so, uh, 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 we have seen a trend, and again, uh, it's, it's because things are really going into that direction with, with AIG, whereby the interest rates for loans to large corporates were linked to their implementation of, of AIG, uh, you know, kind of KPIs. Uh, one example I came across was like a $1 billion loan from ING to Philips. So, do you think that would be uh, that can happen or is happening with smaller companies, for example, those who invest uh, in uh, Bijou or those probably who have looked at Karim? I mean, I can I can jump in. There are examples, um, smaller ones as well. But recently here in the region, we're seeing a lot of these types of products. For example, HSBC recently provided a loan to it, it had um, in, in Abu Dhabi for their uh, sustainable um, aviation uh, programs, right? So it was a very substantial loan. So these types of products and some, some banks and financial institutions are very bullish when it comes to uh, ESG, um, you know, uh, uh, loans and, and, and investing. So it's, it's great. It's great to see it. Sorry, Bijou. No, 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 uh, after you, Karim. After after. No, I've also seen it in uh, real estate, right? So, uh, you know, it's easier some in different countries, right, to, to get a, a, a real estate mortgage or loan if you're investing in, in a green building, for instance, or a lead building, et cetera, right? And you can have better terms, a longer payment period, et cetera. So that, that's my goal. Yeah. yeah, I think overall, um, Mark, um, I, I, there are in, the financial innovations in financial structuring uh, is, is certainly happening as we speak in order to incentivize um, uh, impact and ESG. The, I, I would probably um, say one of the first uh, um, large scale structuring product in that regard were, were the carbon credits, right, which um, which were being uh, provided and, and helping companies achieve that. Of course, that the, the prices have gone up and down, but now it is it is back up. Um, I was talking to uh, the, some, a senior management um, a person at, at a, a company, not, not one of our portfolio companies, but in the renewable energy space, and he was mentioning how the recent increase in carbon credits have increase their ability to secure working capital for cheap um, and therefore um, distribute more of the products that they're distributing um, as a result generating even more carbon credits and, and they're able to figure out very innovative ways in which they can preserve their equity which they had to invest in working capital uh, for a long period of time but now are able to uh, secure very well structured loan products with with which are linked to the um, the carbon credits they earn and so on. So lo a long winded way of saying I think whether it is lowering the interest rate in order to achieve ESG, which we have seen a lot of um, a lot of uh, innovations, particularly from the DFIs, and now it seems like also the larger banks, and also even more innovative financial structuring in terms of bringing in carbon credits or some other. Um, form of providing credits to, um, to, to companies which achieve certain objectives and then selling those credits um, to entities which may not be able to do that in their core business is uh, certainly a possibility and it is happening as we speak. 
So um, just here to, to, to pause and I would like to reiterate that um, if the, uh, the, the audience have questions, it would be great to, uh, for them to ask now. Uh, I think that there was one question from the previous, uh, from the previous panel and I'm, I'm, I don't think it was covered. And actually I wanted to ask about it, which is about talent. Uh, which again, talent is very scarce and very uh, and very important to, to drive change and to implement to implement the um, So, uh, how easy is it to, to to find people with the AG expertise, both at the GP level, so at the investors, and also at the companies to implement those kind of uh, KPIs? Is the question how easy or difficult it is to find yeah, talent? Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. It is. I think um, um, I was coincidentally just sending a note to my fellow colleagues and um, at Le Leapfrog, uh, the health team, yesterday, saying it's. It seems like it is easier to find great quality um, investment talent um, compared to the impact front because there's huge demand as we speak uh, across a wide variety of um, institutions ranging from entities such as ourselves to um, you you alluded to it ESG and impact consultants measurement consultants m and &E firms um, to large um, financial institutions the uh, JP Morgans and Black Rocks and Blackstones of the world so it, it does seem like there's a huge demand but supply is limited and uh, particularly if you add in the um, the rigor and the ability to balance both um, fine, the measurement of financial returns and impact. So, uh, and like I said, we, we want all our professionals, people like me, um, as well as our impact professionals to be able to hold both these realities, uh, the reality that we have to provide our LPs great quality uh, financial return and the reality that we have to reach our consumers who, uh, for whom we are running this um, this uh, franchise, and show great quality returns. There. And, and every single professional at Leapfrog has to have both those qualities: the investment professionals as well as impact professionals. And we have had more success in finding investment professionals who can wear both hats uh, right now at this point than on the um, on the impact front. And whoever we have. Uh, we have attracted our great quality and we are um, uh, uh, we, we want to develop them further. But in order to attract newer talent as we scale, it is indeed um, seems like there is a the, the supply is not um, not sufficient at this point of time. So there is absolutely a need um, for institutions, uh, educational providers, et cetera, who can help um, improve the supply in, in that regard. Probably that, that's another support. way where you can probably invest in those schools or universities to uh, Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I'm just going to say... say uh, sorry, uh, I interrupted you. No, no, no worries. To add to what Bijou said, so also to close the gap, um, training, internally training uh, your employees when it comes to ESG is critical, right? And so everyone needs to understand or needs to live by the ESG principles to some extent, right? So. I think um, education internally in an organization is key. Finding the right talent for sure from the outside, but then maintaining the talent and, and, and educating internally, creating this, the awareness within the organization is, is really a major um, you know, success factor, I believe. And it, it, would, it drives really um, value by you know, having everyone in the organization understand really what ESG means or what impact means. So, a question to you. Uh, I'm given that you focused mainly on kind of emerging markets and even frontier markets. How easy is it for people like Leapfrog or to to to, to, to other investors to find good targets in those uh, markets where sometimes you know that there are much higher priorities than ESG? That's a great question, Mark. Um, on the one hand, the priority is actually when it comes to providing access to critical services, um, uh, renewable energy, healthcare, um, financial services. The, the demand is huge. The gap is significant. 
And there's a huge opportunity to leverage innovative business models, the asset light healthcare model that I described or leveraging technology, which is emerging innovatively to create businesses. So in that sense, there's a huge, um, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, opportunity set um, where great quality um, uh, talent and, and uh, entrepreneurs do exist. And, and we, we have found it, um, found that we can really um, pick and choose. However, uh, as you narrow, so in our case, we are, I'm able to say this with great confidence that we don't have a problem getting good quality pipeline, which meets both the financial returns and impact um, requirements. But that is also because we have a fairly broad geographical coverage while going very narrow in sectors. On the other hand, if you if you are a fund that is focused exclusively on uh, in, in a particular country or a small region, say East Africa or West Africa, then yeah, then then one could start saying um, again the the quality of entrepreneurs and talent is is there. However, if um, as we know, macroeconomic realities sometimes creep in, right? A certain country might have um, a massive uh, FX depreciation. And if that is your biggest market, irrespective of the quality of the entrepreneur, your returns will suffer. Um, so uh, if you don't have that constraint, the constraint impro- imposed by a narrow geography, um, then I don't think, to be honest, talent um, from a uh, from a pipeline perspective, is uh, is is a limitation right now. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Karim, question to you as well here. I mean, before uh, being based in Dubai, we were in Canada, uh, and I assume that Canada is more advanced in terms of PIG investments and, and so on. Uh, in your views, how far is it? Kind of the the Middle East in general is behind uh, developed markets like Canada, US, Europe, and, and, and others? It's, uh, it's really hard to say how far in terms of numbers of years, but I, because the region is catching up so quickly um, that maybe we're, I don't know, uh, 10, one decade or two, but, but it's really catching up quickly. So, it's, so I'll give you an example. Um, in Canada, th- there's been uh, you know, dedicated clean tech, climate tech funds or impact funds for a few decades, um, and these are definitely more mature and more focused. Um, and we we're not seeing that yet in the region here, but uh, I think it's catching up very very quickly, um, especially at the institutional level. So so wealth funds are also um, you know accelerating the pace when it comes to ESG. Yeah. So another trend that we we uh, we are I mean seeing more and more is. Uh, you have the corporate VCs uh, getting more involved in, in ESG investing and launching impact funds, and some of I mean, them we can uh, fight here, like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, City, and so on. Uh, do you think that these kind of mastodons and with their again, some of them are trying to do something good? Would the profit from kind of co-investing with specialized fund managers like Leapfrog? Is this for Bijou or me? Yeah, yeah I'm, Bijou, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm, if you have something to add, that would be great. Yeah, but. I'm happy to take it. I, um, uh, while may not be the specific names that you're talking about, Mark, but definitely significant interest from large global strategics in uh, the spaces that we operate in to partner. Uh, To give you an example, Leapfrog has a a special investment vehicle with Prudential, which which allowed uh, allowed us and them as a result to um, expand our work in the insurance space in, uh, in Africa. And it resulted in us making significant investments in the segment. And ultimately, um, it, it allowed Prudential's expertise, uh, Prudential's um, strategic value add to come into uh, force in these relatively, by their standards, smallish companies, right? So um, if it were Prudential doing it on its own, it would have found it difficult to A, 
um, work with, uh, firstly, um, um, source these kind of transactions because we are on the ground and we have relationships with the promoters. We have certain market knowledge which helps us get into these smaller deals. Um, it also helps them get, get a sense that um, or get comfort that the ESG elements, the um, elements around good governance in particular, we will be able to help um, execute around. So there is there is certainly um, a scope for partnership, which is a win-win where um, the market knowledge and expertise that investors like us bring in, the portfolio companies that can get access to brings in um, can be coupled with the global uh, expertise mm-hmm. Um, of of these strategics and and some of the imperatives that they bring into bear as well. So it's a win-win that we have seen happen in that particular case. And we have multiple, um, at at various points of time, various outreaches happening um, in that regard. Excellent. Uh, Karim, I think you you, you had something to say. No, no, I'm I'm a a true believer in uh, open innovation, right? I believe that uh, you cannot innovate alone, especially for a larger, older organization. You need... uh, to, to partner, as Bijou was saying. So I, I totally believe in the partnership model. It, should, it doesn't have to be necessarily done through a corporate VC program. So it could be simply working with an impact startup that is solving a particular problem that in your operations uh, and you becoming a sponsor uh, or a, a lead user of that product or service uh, would, would uh, already be amazing because these startups need uh, large clients that would actually co-innovate with them, right? So, for for instance, there is uh, the Outliers program with Hub Seventy One. I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's a uh, it's actually a program in the UAE that actually uh, connects. It's a matchmaking uh, program that would find a large organization or even a government entity that needs to solve a, a problem. It could be a, a climate related problem, let's say decarbonization, right? And then find they would that program would help match make um, this organization with a startup that has a product or service to solve this problem. So that is a great, uh, it's a great success uh, program at Top 71 as an example. I think also it would make sense not only to, uh, to, to match a big corporate with, uh, with, with, the, with, with the company or uh, government with the company, but probably also to do uh, a three-way with also with some fund managers. If the fund manager comes up with the idea saying I can run the fund and then I can get you know the government as a cornerstone investor and uh, invest in the companies across the region or in a certain country, I think that would make it even more powerful. Absolutely. So the venture building model um, is a model that is also picking up in the region here, where you have an accelerator with an investor and a, a potentially creating a startup from scratch as well. For a particular problem. So, Karim, there is a question here about this uh, program that you have mentioned. Uh, someone is asking uh, if you can rename it uh, again. Right, it's it's called the Outliers Program with Hub Seventy One. Hub Seventy One. They had a great presentation at the Step Conference uh, last week. In Dubai. Okay, which obviously I missed. <laughs> so, uh, so I. Again, uh, I mean, if there is any question from, because we still have only seven minutes to go, if there are any questions from the audience, it's uh, it's a great to, uh, would be great to, to, to ask now. Uh, uh, while waiting for that, um, so the, we always, when, when we think again about ESG, the first thing comes to mind is the E element and the S element, right? But I think the G element is, again, is quite important and we don't see a lot of that happening or talked about. So um, I would be very curious to know, uh, again, from Bijou and from Kareem, what are your views on the G element, the corporate governance or the governance in in general? Uh, How do you see it as implemented or measured or uh, some real life Kind of examples of, of companies who are focused on on that element. 
I'm happy to uh, take that, um, Mark. So from, from our perspective, um, again, uh, when, when I go through that whole deal cycle, starting from um, origination, when we originate a transaction from a governance perspective, um, we do a fair bit of, um, firstly, uh, you need to um, dig deep into the founder's background and so on, value alignment, et cetera. So that's one big element. But in addition to that, um, we do all the traditional KYC um, checks, which is, again, super important, uh, both from a financial as well as um, a development impact perspective. Uh, once we get into the company, we typically bring on board either from within the LeapFrog team and also outside uh, independent. Um, uh, so firstly, from the LeapFrog team, the investor directors, we sit on the boards of uh, um, all the companies that we invest in, uh, at the very least as an observer, usually as a director. And we try, we do catalyze the um, uh, the independent directors coming in. We make sure that uh, um, you know, 50% of at least the population in the world is, are women. And um, sadly, that's not reflected in, uh, in either senior management or a board level. So we, we try our best to uh, push for that. And in a lot of cases, um, we, we succeed as a result. Um, we look at um, the governance when it comes to uh, the uh, best practices, all the way from the talent um, to how one um, has the you know, typical um, standards such as whistleblower policies and so on, make sure that it is not just in paper, but also um, implementable. And all of these things do add to values, right? Because when you have great quality governance, let's say since we touched upon diversity, it allows for diverse views. It allows for you to, at the right at the board level to senior management and, and, and flowing downwards, respond to a diverse set of um, consumers. Because you're not, unless you're, I don't know, a, a facial hair a company or something like that, you are usually targeting um, both men and women. And you're targeting people across um, multiple um, multiple geographies, races, and, and so on and oh, so forth. And, yeah, yeah. So therefore, um, from our perspective, when we do um, uh, implement these good governance uh, mechanisms, it ends up being um, adding value to the company, and the companies see that. As a result, they are um, they are even more um, willing, able, excited to take these in, into, into account. And, and I think that is the key bit, to be able to show how anything, whether it is E, S, or G, and in general, larger impact, is um, relevant to the uh, company's growth, scale, and profitability. Um, and and it, it all that starts from really finding a company and an entrepreneur and promoter group or senior management team where there is significant value alignment. Mm. I'm sure Karim will have something. Uh, yeah, maybe one, one thing to add. From an ESG perspective, so the, the governance of the entire ESG program, not only the G in ESG, but in that sense, I think um, it's it's really critical to have, you know, to have a an accountability framework where, you know, your executive team is accountable and owns the key KPIs across ESG, right? So... Uh, that I think is is, is major, and I, there is a trend also to link ESG KPIs to to executive pay, um, and you don't see it often. But I think this is this can improve the effectiveness of your uh, governance system in, in, in ESG. Exactly. So I'm not sure we have any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so probably. Uh, Unless, I mean, I, I leave it to you, Karim, and, and be sure if you have any last, uh, last I mean, thoughts to, to share with the audience uh, before we wrap up the, the panel. Well, maybe I can yeah. add one, one yeah. closing yes, remark. I don't think that uh, finding an ESG investment means you have to suffer financially. Uh, in contrary, I believe that the the start of the businesses that are truly that truly believe in their ESG uh, initiatives can be more uh, profitable and can generate more revenue, can grow faster, can attract the best talent, can attract you know uh, more clients, can work better with the government. So I do not I do not think you'd have to compromise by choosing the right business that has the better ESG um, 
program, please. Exactly. Uh, you? No, I would just say um, to having seen the space of impact investing evolve over the last um, decade or so, um, I think we are at probably the most exciting moment and, and in many ways an inflection point. And the reason I say that is the first phase was more about even um, uh, pr providing a rational for one's existence. Why do you need to exist? It's, 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 it's not necessary to be an impact investor. Uh, what is this whole thing? What is impact investing? People, there, there was a phase where um, there were, things were quite blurry and the larger world wasn't um, uh, wasn't as integrated into this little um, microcosm called impact investing. Now that has changed. Now everyone and their uncles are talking about impact investing, which is wonderful. So, which is why I say this is an infl inflection point because now you have to start being quite rigorous. And the next phase will be catalyzed by trillions, not billions, trillions of dollars flowing into the space. Um, asset managers, and you're seeing it, some of the world's yes. biggest asset managers, in fact, the world's biggest asset manager has gone out there and started talking about impact investing and, and taking money in order to achieve impact investing goals and so on. So the next phase will be to make sure um, that the trillions of dollars are not going into impact washing, but mm. actually real creating real impact, because that is the only way um, one can create a more equitable capitalist society. And then whether um, whatever philosophy one believes in, if you look at the last several decades, capitalism is the possibly um, the least of all the evils that one could uh, figure out in terms of an economic system, right? So, and what is its evil? It is that it is not yet equitable. So th this is an opportunity to use the innovation, the capital, the, um, the profit motive, et cetera, that capitalism brings to achieve equitable um, uh, economies across the world not just in emerging markets, but certainly very, very, very uh, relevant in emerging markets. So I, I believe that is the inflection point and, and it, uh, as someone who has been in the space, couldn't be more excited. Excellent, thank you so much Bijou and Karim. Uh, Khaled, uh, up to you to probably introduce the, uh, the next panel. Uh, 